Good afternoon. That was lame. I went to Queens College. I think Queens College is the best college in Queens. What do you think? Okay, so good afternoon. My name is Andrea Shapiro Davis. I'm Associate Vice Chancellor at CUNY, and I am one of the creators of CUNY Arts. This is our first program out of Manhattan, and we are delighted to bring jazz at Lincoln Center to Queensboro Community College. What do you think? How many of you have ever seen a live jazz performance? Okay, quite a few of you. How many of you have ever been to jazz at Lincoln Center? Fantastic. Well, you are going to have the opportunity of a lifetime here. These performers are amazing. So I just want to say welcome. Thank you very much. Is CUNY in the house? Yeah. Is Queens College the best college in Queens? Yeah. Is Queensboro in the house? Yeah. Have a great time. Thank you, Candace. Thank you to all the performers. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you, Andrea. I am so happy to, to be here and to welcome these, these great musicians to Queensboro. I'm Mark Sheeby, I teach in the English department, and um, um, it's been really fun to put together this event. We started in the middle of the summer, and here we are finally on October 10th, which is um, uh, the birthday of one of the great bebop innovators, Thelonious Monk. So I think we're celebrating his 101st birthday today, Thelonious Monk and you're gonna hear some bebop in a couple of minutes. Um, I thought I'd tell you about how this came together. We, there's a number of us in the English department that teach the works of James Baldwin and we really are inspired by his writing and we love to, um, to um, read Baldwin with students and um, a number of us, we figured out, teach the story, Sonny's Blues, um, one of his great st short stories about a jazz pianist and his relationship with his brother. And um, I think there are over 20 uh, English classes this fall who are teaching, uh, who are reading and studying this story. So can, can you raise your hand if you're studying Sonny's Blues this semester? You can see how many hands went, went up. So I think some of my students are here and we have over 20 classes. So um, there'll be a chance to, um, after the performance, uh, if you wanna come up and ask a question um, to these musicians about Baldwin or about their own artistic practice, that would be, that would be great. Um, in fact, I can pass this mic around, mic around the, um, the audience and you can have a chance to talk. Um, I wanna give the stage to Candace in just a minute, but I just thought I'd share one anecdote. Just from yesterday, I was, um, I was watching uh, The Price of the Ticket, this great documentary about Baldwin. Um, from 1989, a couple years after he died, and um, we were thinking about um, the way that Baldwin was inspired by music, and he, he tells a little story in the documentary about when he was in Switzerland, he had to get away from the United States, um, and he was living in a little village up in the Alps, and he was beginning to write his first novel, Go Tell It on the Mountain, and he said, you know, during that time he was listening to records over and over by Bessie Smith and Fats Waller. And those were the songs and the rhythms that gave him what he called the key to the, the, key to the language, the key to the language, back his, his entrance back into the American idiom that he really innovated in so beautifully. So um, I think today is a day we're gonna talk about Baldwin's language and the way that, that music really permeates it. Um, and I just want to say two sentences about Candace. Here's Candace. I have a quote from NPR, from NPR about Candace Hoyes. Um, <clears throat> she's a composer intentional about reflecting the world she lives in as well as sounding great and growing and grooving. She's a lecturer at Jazz at Lincoln Center, and you can hear her debut album on Spotify right now. So welcome to Candace Hoyes and her quintets. Am I 
give each place with your man done fell through you'd be too was a Thank you. This is Misha Nish Nishimura on the piano. This is, did I say Mika? Did I say Mika? Okay, Mika. <laughs> this is India Owens on the bass. 
Lakeisha Benjamin on the saxophone. And Jerome Jennings on the drums and percussion. And I'm Candice. Thank you so much for having us. Um, so this, this, this afternoon that we have together is called Bebop and Baldwin. And uh, this is an open conversation. As you see, for us, music is a conversation and a language. And um, Baldwin is nothing but a fearless, uh, a fearless writer and a fearless artist. And so he dove into the language of, um, that we just began to share with you. This song, Am I Blue, you do, raise your hand if you recognize it from the story. Yes, and um, it's a beautiful thing to introduce a color and associate it with a sound. Am I blue, what does that really mean? So we'll get into that, but um, we're gonna explore the intersection of jazz and storytelling through the eyes of James Baldwin. We're gonna welcome Jean to this stage. <laughs> From the English department. Hi, thank you, Candice. Uh, you can hear me, yeah? Okay, thanks guys, that was beautiful. So I'm Jean Murley, I am also a professor in the English department. And we wanted to, as Candace said, integrate some of the uh, elements of the story with the music, because of course it is a story that richly illustrates music. So, um, and Jean, are we going to share a reading of it? You'll let me know. We are. Okay. Yeah, we are. Um, that's the second question. Yeah. Oh, sorry. That's fine. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. So I'd like to begin, and I had shared this with, with Candace and the other musicians. This is James Baldwin's definition of art. He said that art is to, quote, prove and to help one bear the fact that all safety is an illusion, end quote. So I wanted to ask you, what you think that jazz and the world of jazz and bebop meant to James Baldwin in terms of that personal definition of art, that essentially art helps us to bear the pain and the danger of the world? Well, I think um, it's an ideal question and a place to start to talk about Sonny's Blues and the author, the very particular um, author of, of Sonny's Blues. James Baldwin, as many of you know, um, grew up in Harlem. And so his earliest years were spent uh, in the, much in the environment that he describes in the story that, that um, Sonny's brother, the narrator, and Sonny uh, experience. And so the hardships and the challenges are ones that are extremely personal to him, very visceral to him. They're the same conditions that defined his boyhood and his exceptional ability to write. Many of you may know, he wrote his school song when he was 13. He began, he found the pen um, at a very early age. He was a preacher like his stepfather, who he called his father. And so he began to express himself at a very early age in Harlem and yet was reflecting the world um, around him and that was shaping him. And part of it is about pain. Um, in accessing music, whether it was a song that he wrote or the jazz that was um, much a soundtrack to his life in Harlem. The times when James Baldwin was, were, was growing up in the 20s and, well, he was born in the 20s, so the 20s, 30s, 40s, you have the emergence of jazz in Harlem. It's all around him, even though he's a child. You know, children are the best observers, right? Wouldn't you say? Especially when something's fun and slightly forbidden and maybe new and <laughs> so um, I think that it was not just uh, about finding a way to express suffering, although um, Baldwin has never shied away from, from the intensity of his feelings or perspective on the world, but it was also the way that he saw the people in his community expressing themselves beyond what he wanted to write. Um, so I think to, to answer you quite directly, uh, he observed 
Char the emergence of Charlie Parker and Bebop. These were things that were um, really in his everyday vernacular. These are the things that made his community excited. And this, this was the music, the popular music of his time. And yet he also knew the artists in a very intimate way. These are the people in his community that were playing jazz at Minton's Harlem, which uh, Minton's Playhouse at that time, which you guys can still go uptown when you get on, you know, you're up in Harlem and go have a night at the same place where James Baldwin likely heard his jazz at Minton's Playhouse. Um, and a lot of the bebop innovators honed their craft there. So I think it just was, a ref it was him being his uh, most candid self. And some of it was about um, the story of suffering and some of it was about the story of just uh, black people and black artists specific specifically expressing themselves. Yeah, I, I agree, um, and I, I particularly, uh, I just love the, the idea that art helps us bear our, our burdens, right? And that comes out so clearly in Sonny's Blues, and music in particular. Um, and music, particularly this form of music as a communal form, that it brings people together that it uh, highlights individual talent, but it also coalesces into something very, very unique and um, says a lot about the power of community to transcend difficult circumstances, whether it's racism or poverty or whatever the case might be. I love that about jazz, that every, every musician takes a, a turn. Mm -hmm. Yes, the dialogue dialogic act, um, aspect is very strong. But I think what was really interesting was, um, you know, Baldwin lived through the, well, jazz emerged at the turn of the 20th century in the recorded form and, um, you know, as ed, and became popular here and overseas. Um, and then it, it um, at, you know, the time that, uh, the time that, that uh, what we're talking about is bebop, but what preceded bebop was swing. And that was, a, a, are you guys familiar? Raise your hand if you've heard of the term swing. So yes, and Queens is a very, spe it's a very spe um, special incubator for, the, for jazz. It's a lot of really incredible artists that we've all studied with and know emerged from, from Queens, namely Louis Armstrong and there, there are many. So there was swing and swing was used for dancing. It was used also, it was like one of the first ways that a lot of black musicians could make a livelihood at music, which is a radical notion, right? Because, um, you know, for a lot of us, well, no, not for a lot of us, for all of us, the presumption was uh, working in a service capacity, or, you know, the educational opportunities for black people in the 20s and 30s were limited. And so when you have a real industry, of jazz and entertainment, you create opportunities for people to be professional artists, which all, you know, paved the way for all of us to do this as a living. And that was swing. And, you know, there are certain things about when you commodify art that are liberating. And these artists were so brave, just like James Baldwin, which is why he chose this to be featured in Sonny's Blues, that they went even further than economic empowerment and personal success. And that's what bebop represents. It's um, a, a deeper liberation. It's a smaller group of people having a more specific conversation um, and really daring as far as harmonies, as far as um, chord changes, as far as treatment of the melody, and uh, just as far as being very radical in their expression. And so also that's another way of taking uh, one's experience and making it something that's enduring, but it, it became really personal. The way that he writes, the way that you found he writes, which is really radical and highly personal. One of my favorite uh, selections from the story occurs in the very ending scene where the narrator, Sonny's brother, goes to hear Sonny and his his fellow musicians perform at the club. Um, and I'd, I'd like to share that, and it, it sparks another question for you. 
So this is, this is the narrator. And those of you who've read the story, you'll, you'll recognize this. He has an epiphany and he, for the first time in his life, he begins to understand Sonny, his, his brother. And it's via the music, right? He, he understands his brother, it's a very personal relationship, through the music that Sonny is playing. And he describes the music like this. He says, then he began to make it his. And he's talking about Sonny, of course. It was very beautiful because it wasn't hurried and it was no longer a lament. I seemed to hear with what burning he had made it his, with what burning we had yet to make it ours, how we could cease lamenting. Freedom lurked around us and I understood at last that he could help us to be free if we would listen, that he would never be free until we did. And I think there are just so many connections to the present moment in that, in that statement about what music can do for people. It can bring us together. It can surmount obstacles that nothing else in the world could do. And the question that I have is for you and your musicians, the other, the other performers, can such communal forms of music like jazz or even hip hop, that is music that is created by and for and about a specific community, can that music allow us to transcend our troubles? And how does that work? And furthermore, I'd like to add, um, if you could share with us, each of you, I know this, this might be a very large question, but what being a musician means to you? That's what I would like to ask each of you. Sure, so the, the first question that we will we'll take on is can music help transcend your troubles? And then also, what does being a musician mean to us? Some of us have more of a um, preference for verbal, verbalizing, so I'll just let, let my colleagues choose who wants to speak on it. Um, I think that it's it, the beautiful thing about James Baldwin and his writing and why it's ex essential in 2018 and 2019 is that it's an unflinching look at the truth. What does that mean? That means that he bears, uh, you know, it's a first, it's a first person narrator, narration. It's a, it's a bearing witness to the truth as you know it, the reality as you know it. It's not turning away when something hurts. I think it's very poignant that the narrator's daughter, you know, poetically named Grace, dies at age two of, a, of polio, which is, I believe, a preventable disease even then. It's debatable. Oh, okay, so it wasn't. Well, nonetheless, it's not, it's, it's, to me, it's juxtaposed with, um, I was gonna check, actually, and I didn't, I wasn't able to, but I thought it was an interesting juxtaposition, the suffering of a two-year-old dying, Grace dying of polio, in juxtaposition to a young adult man, Sonny, struggling with heroin. So there are many, there's a range of struggles. We turn away from none of them in this story, and we turn it into a powerful tool of communication by making it a story. And every time I make music, that's why I make music. It's to tell stories. Um, some of them will pain you and some of them will inspire you. And I think that the point is to stay engaged with all of it anyway. So does anybody wanna talk about um, why you're a musician? And do you? That would be wonderful. How's everyone doing tonight? Today. It's today. It's definitely today. It's so today. Okay. <laughs> so um, I, play, I play music because I am so in love with music, and I'm thankful to God that I get to play it every day. Um, I just wanted to touch on the first question, too, about rap. I always think of rap as just a continuum of jazz. And jazz is a continuum 
of the field howlers, the work songs during, during slavery, way before James Baldwin. That's how we always got through struggles. That's how the hopefulness and the joy and the pain was all meshed together into one. So it's just a long continuum of everything. And it, it also is so powerful because it can change the way you think. It could change the way you feel about yourself. For example, um, I remember watching videos of Duke Ellington and the sophistication was just beautiful. I mean, just the level of musicianship, the joy of everyone playing together, dancing together during such a hard time. It, it was so powerful. When I heard Charlie Par Parker, it was so powerful that someone could even think of being that free in their music. And it was just a response to the social climate and political climate for black people at that time. And for me, um, I love jazz. Uh, relating it to rap, when I heard the miseducation of Lauryn Hill, for example, I had a lot of issues with how I viewed myself. You know, I used to, I, I did not think I was beautiful unless I straightened my hair. But when I saw her, when I heard her, her lyrics, I was like, wow, you know, I can, I can love myself the way she loves herself. But getting, getting back to music, um, well, getting, continuing. <clears throat> with music, um, it's such a spiritual thing. It's, it's beyond us. You know, it's a, it's a God-given gift to enjoy music, to be a part of music. And, and I remember the first time that I knew that I really wanted to do it, I, I was actually in a homeless shelter and I had to bring my bass there every day because my mom was like, okay, um, but this bass, you gotta practice. <laughs> so, so I was a teenager at the time. And, and the thing about those places is that it's a lot of sadness going on all over. But I remember, I can't really play that well, but I, I knew how to play in one key. I knew how to play on one string, and it was the D string, that's why it's my favorite key. And I remember I was playing it, I closed my eyes, I was getting into it, and then I opened my eyes, and all these women were surrounding me. And, and just that sadness turned into joy, and I realized like this is, this is something more powerful than, than what I even thought it was. And music can bring people together, like my family at functions, when, when, some, when we hear our songs, like, before I let go, it's going down. Like, <laughs> everybody's dancing, everybody's singing, everybody's clapping, nobody's, nobody's beefing anymore. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's, that's a little part of what music means to me. Um, and, you know, it's just, we, we have this closeness, all of us, um, even though like this is the um, first time that Mika and I have played together, we've worked together at Jazz Lincoln Center, and uh, Lakeisha and I met yesterday when she was talking about something she's very passionate about, and uh, India and Jerome and I have had the pleasure of playing together, and there's so many layers of, of personal origin that we discover every time we play, and then when we get to spend time and talk. So um, I'm glad you told me that's so. That's wonderful. I, I want to also ask. Um, so I, I want to also illuminate that you know these performers play in New York. We all do, but we play all over the world. So music, to answer you, has taken us everywhere, really. Um, and among me, amongst our, our, ourselves, um, they play with musicians such as um, Christian McBride, but also Kendrick Lamar, and. Um, is there anyone who wants to share anything else about either being an artist or? Yes, Jerome. Oh, okay. Yeah, how's everybody doing? That's good. 
I know you're doing well because you already covered that. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think um, just alluding to some some of your other questions here. Um, I think of Sunny Blues, and I'm thinking, you know, hip hop. You know, uh, I think Sonny's brother was stricken in this story as well because he 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 he's touched a bit of success, and his brother has not in the same kind of way. But his Sonny's brother is, is stricken because he doesn't have the same form of expression, a way to express himself. So the way I feel is when African-Americans reach a certain level of success, you cannot forget about people who look like you who are still disenfranchised and still, still dealing with this thing called racism. And me being a musician, I have a responsibility. Um, I feel like until African Americans are totally free, not halfway, Tamir Rice, his, his murderer, is back on the force in Ohio, by the way, yesterday. Um, we have a responsibility to illuminate, and alluding back to the first um, Baldwin quote, I don't know what it was exactly. Yes, art is supposed to help us bear the pain, right? So it can't help us bear the pain if it doesn't have, if it doesn't help illuminate what's going on wrong in society. It's like Amir Baraka says, uh, your, 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 your art should have teeth, right? And I want my art to do that. I want every, I mean, I, I, but don't be, don't be fooled, don't be misled. I don't believe an artist or sports figure will ever liberate a total a group of people. It just won't happen. No disrespect. But I don't think an artist or a sports figure will ever be able to liberate a group of people from under a system. Because history shows us that that has never happened. But I do feel like artists and musicians, or artists, musicians, painters, Sports figures who I can, who I assume I feel are artists, have a responsibility, particularly um, artists with a certain type of consciousness. You have to let people know what's going on at some point in your in, in your career, but it takes a sacrifice. I feel like part of my my calling is to not just play drums. I used to be. Like, I have to play drums. It's like a dopamine thing. I love playing drums. It like feels so good. But it, the older I get and, and, and the more I hang with younger people and, and, and I go from school to school and, 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 and talk to lower income students and I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, so I, I understand. My responsibility is to let people know what's going on if they don't and use my art in some kind of way in, in an entrance, in, 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 and now I'm, I'm getting to this intersectional thing, which I feel like Baldwin would have been much more potent and, 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 and much more uh, powerful if he could have been himself all the time, okay? So people like Baird, Rustin, uh, Baldwin, Billy Strayhorn, they had to live in the dark and come out at night, and come out during the day, you know what I'm saying? So you guys understand that Baldwin was a homo, he was homosexual. But it was not, that wasn't allowed to be. So I feel like it wasn't acceptable, it wasn't acceptable at all. So I, I'll just leave you guys with this. You checking out Baldwin, I want you guys to check out what came before, like you were talking about um, scholars before, um, Baldwin, after Baldwin. Du Bois. Du Bois, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, I want you all to check out people who he checked out, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, these, these, these people. Uh, and then maybe get into, there's a woman named Sarah Haley who wrote a book called No Mercy Here. That's a fantastic book. Uh, Richard B. Moore. Check out people after Baldwin, okay? so you can get a well-rounded understanding. Don't just stay in the 50s and 60s. 
There's a lot happening right now because the Black Lives Matter movement is very powerful. Thank you, thank you. Um, that was that was wonderful. Can we have some more music? Absolutely, Lakeisha. Would you like to introduce the next two selections? I'll tell them a little bit why we chose these together. Um, and these two next selections uh, are really featuring the bebop. And in in particular, we decided to well, I decided to look at a uh, iconic recording from around the time right after James Baldwin was born and was growing up in Harlem um, by Charlie Parker. And so they are really expressive of that. And do you want to introduce the tunes? How you guys doing out there? So, uh, we're talking about James Baldwin and music of bebop. So these next two songs are by Charlie Parker. Charlie Parker was, some would consider maybe the innovator of bebop, him Dizzy Gillespie and Thelonious Monk. And we spoke a little bit before about how swing came before bebop. And swing at that time was directly out of the blues. So we have been speaking about what it means to have a message, what it means to have your own voice, what it means to play with your own song. And what happened with jazz is, out of the field hollers, out of the blues, they became a deep, kind of like a pressure cooker. You know, if you hold somebody down long enough and, and give them no way, if you walk down the street and spoke, a cop might arrest you. If you look the wrong way, you may get beat. You weren't allowed to go into certain restaurants. You weren't allowed to go into certain places. So when the Harlem Renaissance really came about and swing was thriving, African Americans had learned, and for years now, decades, how to deal with oppression in a positive way, how to have your own style, your own walk, your own say, while somebody's over your head looking at you the whole time. So in swing, when you had Duke Ellington, it's the sophistication and the, the pride of blackness was starting to become a big thing. People were flocking to Harlem poets from all over the world just to be a part of something where they could be their self in the capacity they could. Harlem was like the only place where you could have a little bit of dignity to yourself at night in the streets. So Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, they all got together and they had started expressing themselves in a more sophisticated way. Before everything was about dancing, jolly life, this was more about the sophistication of the harmony. This was more about how can I express myself in a more profound way. So the first song we're gonna do is entitled Moose the Mooch. And the second one is Yardbird Sweet. And um, I'll get back to you with more after that.
Yes, I, I hope he is looking at us and is proud. That felt so wonderful, right? So I, I just have to, to ask, I wanna ask if anybody wants to share just even you know, succinctly. So a big feature in, this, in Sonny's Blues is that Sonny is, is, finds his way to Isabel's family's house, right? And that's his good luck opportunity, maybe as Jerome was highlighting, his chance for success. And he just, he just plays himself out of his opportunity, doesn't he, in a sense? In some, by, by his brother's perspective, he, he practices incessantly. How, why? Why is he so driven? Is it, it's not just the, that dopamine feeling to practice all the time. There's something very particular about bebop um, that has to be, ex you have to experience your way through it. It's, even though we've all been to music school and now some of these um, fine artists teach at music schools as well, right? Um, Sonny has to find his sound by practicing incessantly and hanging out all the time listening to music. Is there anybody who wants to mention someone who helped them find their sound? And how do you find the sound that we just enjoyed right now and we just felt? Anybody? Hi, guys, again. So um, I think for me, if we're talking about the bebop era, it was Charlie Parker, definitely Dizzy Gillespie, a little bit in the bebop era, but kind of after Jackie McLean. And I feel like... Um, one of the things with finding your sound and who you are is if you can't know who you are, if you don't know where you come from. So one of the biggest things with me finding my voice and finding a way to express myself in a world that all kinds of craziness is going on, right? So I feel like the first thing you would, I had to do or anybody should do is to really study, to study and master it is what you're trying to learn. You have to really understand where the music has come from, where the history it is, where the language. Because what, you're going, what I'm communicating on this saxophone is a language. And without me being able to speak it, you may not understand my particular message. So become as big a virtuoso as you can in your instrument, Come as, become as superior as you can on the instrument. And then with that information, you can you utilize the ideas that you have in your head, you can articulate them. Without me understanding how to play a quarter note, I wouldn't be able to articulate that. So, the goal for me of practicing so many hours, sweating, not going outside, hanging out. Oh, the basement. Um, she's talking about, um, this is not a bebop artist, but um, this is more um, after coaching the free period. I used to play with an artist called Rashid Ali. Rashid Ali used to play with uh, the master John Coltrane. And I played with him until he died. Not his whole life, so maybe the last eight years. And what he used to do is he used to have a clock in the basement which is already a scary idea. But you go down there. <laughs> At the time, I probably was 21, 22. And we go down there and he would say, um, he put a towel over the clock. He said, you know what, girl, I want you to play whatever you can as fast as you can. So for me, a saxophone player, I'm like, yes, let's do this. And as I was playing, after you know, five, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, I said, when are we gonna stop? And I kept trying to end the song. And every time I tried to end the song, he kept doing this little slick thing with the hi-hat. I was like, we're still in the song. So after a while, I kept playing because my pride was there, you know? Eventually, my lips weren't with my pride. And they started um, kind of bleeding a little bit. And I was like, no, I'm going to play with Rashid Ali. I'm not going to stop playing. Nothing's going to make me stop. And it was good that I had that determination because it got me far. But eventually, I stopped. And I, I, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't stop, he wouldn't talk to me, he had sunglasses on, in a basement, playing, not looking at me, like the drums were this way. So finally, I just put the sax on the floor and looked him dead in the face. And he got up and was like, okay. Took the towel down. He said, it's been 45 minutes, you did good, girl. And I was like, what, what was the point of that? And he told me that when he played with John Coltrane, John Coltrane would do the same thing to him. And the idea was to, that as musicians, we're athletes. And you need the stamina and the, the language skill set to be able to talk for 45 minutes and keep people interested. But you also need to have the ability to do it. So what I learned from that is before Rashid Ali learned how to be Rashid Ali, he was studying. He was studying what the people before him did that were great. He was studying the ideas that were coming to his mind and finding a way to put that together 
so that he can make a message and a statement to the world that people could understand. So that's what I try to do. I try to learn as much as I can so that when I play, you can understand it. And I hope that every great, you know, I play with a lot of rap artists. You mentioned Kendrick Lamar. I play with J. Cole. I play with Alicia Keys, Stevie Wonder. I play with a lot of people. And what they all have in common, no matter the genre of music, is that they studied enough and they have enough language that when it's time to really express what you're feeling, they can take you to another level. And that's the spirituality in music. And in, inside of us as a people, I think, that has gotten us this far. And if anybody could change the world to do something about the climate going on now, because now is not that different from James Baldwin's time. There's still things that weren't acceptable then that are acceptable now. But when no one's looking, we turn on the news in the morning, we're going to see another person shot looking like me and you. So if you want to have a real message and make a real change, do your homework and study. Get it together, but also come up with something that's powerful that somebody like me is waiting to hear, you know? Thank you, Lakeisha. And I, as, a, as a compliment to what she's saying, I've heard James Baldwin say in, in, you know, with his own voice in interview that when he was 22, he lost his best friend who jumped off the Washington, the George Washington Bridge, at, who was a 24-year-old person and he thought to himself that um, he might just end up doing the same thing and the interviewer said why what what drove what do you feel drove him to that and he said despair so if I were to ask all of you to close your eyes and raise your hand and you know connect with whether or not you you've experienced such a despair even at a young age of whether it's too like little grace or you know age 22 um, it's a part of of the artistic process at from time to time it's not all peaks it's not all insta famous it's not all you know microwave pleasure and success and I think um, that's that's a part of it and he, also in the story, uh, the two brothers discuss the aspect of avoiding suffering and whether we head into it when we're making music or if we play through it. Um, I wouldn't say I'm suffering, but I am. Um, I have a boy in here, a black boy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and that is sublime, but it's also very, I'm very, it's a very earthy experience. Um, and that's not a euphemism, it just is. And uh, I, sh am, I should be, well, many, not, there's no really should, but you know, medically speaking, I could be on a maternity leave at this point. But I, re I recorded my next album last week. And I think this is a dimension that um, James Baldwin would appreciate me sharing this story because I'm a black artist and I'm free and I can today because of him. So I continue to work and make music for the same reason that all of us have referenced and the same reason that Baldwin's floor was full of crumpled papers and why he exiled himself to Paris to be free and create his work. A lot of you are gonna be teachers, social workers, writers, doctors, um, parents, all kinds of things that you haven't yet imagined, but I think that the the impetus from James Baldwin's work, in particular this one, is to um, persevere and bear witness to your truth, no matter what you're experiencing. So, Mark, is there more that we should explore? We ask questions of the audience, or, or rather they ask questions of us. That's how that works. I think we have a little bit of time. You actually just covered um, the what I wanted to ask in part, which is one of my favorite parts of the story, is when Sonny goes to live with his sister-in-law, and drives them absolutely insane with the piano and the amount he actually practices. And I think Baldwin says at some point that family thought he was either a god or a monster because of how much he p played the piano. And I know Lakeisha just told a story about stamina in playing with Rashid Ali, which is amazing. But um, I was just going to ask, you know, um, you know, how do you practice? And how much do you practice? And how much do you practice listening to the records and learn from learn by ear from records? Because jazz is such such a you know it's not it's not really about the written page you know. Um, and Lakeisha already told that story, but I wonder if 
anyone wants to speak to, like what it took to get to this level of playing, you know? So I think that um, for me, it was the kind of repetition that she describes and the kind of passion and the kind of unsinkable, um, unsinkable commitment to saying something and hopefully fortifying people with music and that the technique that evolved over that has allowed me to um, you know, be this pregnant and record my album and be with the people I wanna be with making music and do my work and create my work. Um, and I think that that's, that's important. It's not important to be perfect. Maybe I, d I sound perfect or I don't today, but I don't really, I'm not preoccupied with it. So the technique is there and the repetition is there so that when we hit and we're together, we're fully present and we are making music for one time only. And everything that you heard only exists now. And that's the urgency that we take it with. And um, I'd like to let someone else share. <laughs> okay, well, well, I love just listening to records before I even get the bass in my hands just to internalize everything and just know what's going on, know what the song is about. And then I try to play with the record because that's how my mentors told, told me to do it. Um, they told me to learn it by ear. Um, I had a mentor, Marcus Belgrave. He was actually the first person to get me into jazz, first person to get me my first gig. It was $25, by the way. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I think it's a, a bit of openness you have to have and vulnerability with yourself because when I first heard jazz, I actually heard Charlie Parker, and it was a lot for me. I was like, okay, there's no way I can play the bass like that. There's, there's no way I can play that. And it took mentors to help me believe that I could do it. So I'm, I'm thankful for them. And over time, it's, it's a slow process to get good at anything. So I would do it slow, slower and <laughs> slower until I got it under my fingers. So that was pretty much my process, but it was because of my mentors. We have a lot of, I know we have a lot of students here who, who have studied this story and I just wanna give a chance to, um, I know Candace is gonna sing, sing one more in a minute for us. And I just want to mention that um, there's going to be, uh, we have a reception right outside in the lobby of the Performing Arts Center for anyone who wants to stay and, and hang um, with the performers and have some uh, coffee and cookies. Um, and uh, that'll, that'll happen right after the last song. But before that, I wanted to give a chance to any students who wanted to ask a question to, about any of this stuff uh, to the performers. I have a mic here, you can come up or, uh, there's a mic being passed around too. So. Hi, my name is Jeremy Wall. Um, I'm a student here of uh, Dr. Tuchinska's in her Black New York class. Uh, thank you for coming here. First of all, oh my gosh, the technical fireworks that I've heard tonight were just amazing. Uh, Coltrane definitely was heard and perhaps Art Tatum as well was ringing my ears. But my question is essentially how does place affect the music that you make um, and how might uh, you change that, um, that music towards a place or, or do you at all. Uh, thank you for being here, I appreciate your time. Jerome, do you wanna? What do you say? The question is how does the place, the oh. venue, the, the space, venue and, and, uh, and the people affect the music that you, that you produce that like, comes out of you? Like playing in or, or living? Okay, let's, okay, specifically me. Okay, well we could go with Baldwin, I mean he moved. He's looking for some peace to deal with what he needed to deal with, right? Too much clouding here, too much cloud, I think was too much, it was too heavy. But I, I feel uh, I feel the venue, it makes a difference. Um, I just did a gig last night with James Poyser. He's a piano player with the Roots. And we have been playing a lot of gigs at a place called the Django, which is like, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bar type area, hip place but people talk and you can I mean it's cool I don't mind 
But we played so many gigs there that when, by the time we got to the jazz standard yesterday and everybody was quiet, nobody was really clapping. He's trying to get the church thing going and then people just looking like. <laughs> but it, it didn't matter because we already, we played so much together in this place that was like considered loud or you hear the glasses clinging. I don't know, man. My, my first gigs was, was in a bar. Like a, it was not alcoholic, but it was, other, it was things happening in there. I was, you know, so like, I, I like, I like all places. I mean, sometimes I feel like when you put the music in a, in like a Carnegie Hall type situation where it, I feel like respectfully it should be there, it can be a little stuffy. Like the people don't understand culturally what African American music is about. So they sit there and if somebody make noise, they look at them and shush them. I remember one time I had a gig at a, at a place and, and, and my mom came to hang out because it, it was a run with my band. And she was like, is it all right if I eat this chi these chicken wings with my finger? I said, eat them chicken wings with your finger and if somebody say something, just tell them to holler at me. Because <laughs> it's a way we do things that makes me feel comfortable. But it's also, if you're gonna bring the music into a venue or a place that's not used to housing African-American art, they need to understand what we do and come to us instead of us coming to them. That's how I feel. <laughs> we have a couple more questions. Thank you. My name is Kofi. Um, I'm Hi, taking Kofi. special topics in African American literature this semester. And um, my question is that Given the, the fluidity of, of the music, the composition, what comes first? Is it the melody, the harmony, or the lyrics? All of us compose, right? Everybody here. Um, well, Kofi, I will answer for myself. Um, it alternates between, for me, um, text and melody. Uh, it's frequently text because I feel like I, I would trace it to my, my childhood. Probably I was reading before I was, I was playing music. But I don't know. I think it's, a, it's highly particular. Um, I think it's like creating anything you could encounter, a subject matter, say, you know, uh, you travel somewhere and the sights and the smells inspire you and you decide that that's, that's something that you're gonna compose, compose about. Um, does anybody wanna talk about their process or would you say that it's just totally individual to each, each circumstance? Yeah, <laughs> we, so does that answer the question? It's, it's for each person, do you want to know what I do? The, the uniqueness is it's, it, it's intriguing yes. because um, I try to think about it in terms of how you're able to um, harmonize all these keys and have beautiful music. Does it, is it instantaneous? Or you kind of do all the writing and then you try to find a rhythm to what you've written? Um. You conceive of things in a skeletal fashion, mostly, unless someone wants to add or contradict or, no or dialogue with me. No There's no one way, but frequently what we do, because we do this for our livelihood and it's a, just for, from now until we're 100, we'll be composing, probably, all of us, because we, we compose in our head even if we're not writing it down. There's a sort of skeletal, Rendering, like if you were constructing an aircraft or a garment, there's a foundational thing. We'll write down words, or if they, I write down words because I write for myself frequently. They'll write down a, a a piece, a theme, an idea, a melodic idea, or a harmonic idea. Um, they'll jot it on something like maybe a piece of paper or a napkin, or maybe they'll go deep into the shed and write everything out. But what we do is, just to answer your question in essence, 
we write it um, to the extent that we want ourselves a part of it, and then we hand it to the rest of the band, and we let and we d we communicate to them how much of themselves we want to put them to put into it, and we choose our band very particularly, like you choose your your mate or your person, you know, your special someone. All these people are special someones, so. We choose them to according to their voice and their gifts. Okay? Yeah. Hi. Um, I've read Go Tell on the Mountain. I wrote a paper about it. And I haven't read Sunny's Blues yet, although I've known about it. And um, I intend to read it. Seeing this presentation, you guys on stage, and the juxtapos juxtaposition of music and literature, I got to thinking, has anybody ever made a, a stage musical or a, a play with music out of Sonny's Blues or has been adapted to film or television, to your knowledge? And is it, if they haven't, or even if they have, would you guys consider maybe trying to do something like that or maybe inspiring somebody else to, to turn it into a stage play or you know, a, a play with music or a musical? Uh, well, I, I'm not aware of, of this piece um, being turned, uh, but although I wouldn't, I wouldn't really say that I, I know it's, it was written in the, in the late fifties and it's highly possible. And I know that Beale Street came out as a film just yesterday. So that's something everybody can go check out if you love Baldwin or you're intrigued. Mark, do you know about how to answer that? Uh, is there, Cezanne, yeah, I, I don't know of any any adaptation of Sonny's Blues. I do know Baldwin wrote some plays that that you can that you, that have been filmed. Um, blues for Mr. Blues for Mr. Charlie, for example, in the middle of the 1960s, that you can see a, a version of, which has some of the same themes, especially dealing with the African American family. Yeah, so and there's some music in that. So, Thank you. As best as I can do. Um, you. Well, Mark, we have another question right here as well, but I'll let you, okay. Hi. Hello, I'm Sky. Hi, uh, Sky. I'm also in African American literature class. Uh, I know that as an artist that talking about your process or whatever can be weird to articulate because you know, you're sort of just doing it. Uh, I'm not a musician or anything. Uh, I don't have the mind for it, I'm just a writer. But I, I know that when you're, when you're really in the, in the swing of it, when you're really, feeling that you just sort of can't stop it, whatever. My question is, how do you feel like you put an end to like your pieces of music or whatever? Because I feel like when I'm writing sometimes, I don't want to ever stop the story. I just want to keep going and going and going, but I know that I have to clip it off at some point. So how do you as musicians feel that you've come to a certain point and you're something that like, okay, it's time to just nip it right there? Um, so does anybody, shall I? I, I revise the things I write all the time, and then I just recorded it. Like uh, most of my next album is stuff or songs that I wrote. And when we got in the studio, and I had a producer with me, the songs definitely took another, another. Uh, they're like cats with nine lives, so it took another life there. And every time you perform it, it does it does sort of evolve and change. You don't ha even have to force it. And then occasionally we revisit something because it might have, like because of place and venue, you know, um, sometimes like there's a work that I recorded, uh, this is my first album that I'm gonna um, approach with strings next year at, at Arlem stage. So that's a concrete example. Sometimes you have like a new ensemble and so you have to expand the voicing and expand the sound in a way to accommodate it or to reduce it, like you have a really simple setup um, and you have to figure out and decide what's essential, what you want to keep, no matter what. Uh, so I think it's it's highly particular, uh, but I think we, we you can't, part of writing, whether it's literature or music or anything that you're designing, I think you, you should not try to impose limits on yourself about when something's complete or done, unless it's something that, you know, comes from your, if that's something that's important to your process, but for me, it's not. I think, I think we have time for, for maybe one more question and then I'm gonna play 
play another, sing another one, one, one or two more, it'd be great. Yes. Hi, uh, my question is, how, like at the beginning of your careers, how do you guys deal with um, doubt from your, have you ever had like doubt or like, like someone tell you you can't, like this should be a hobby, shouldn't be a job that leads you to like future like financial, being successfully financial, how do you deal with that? Absolutely. My that, my friend, um, he was dealing with that with his father. He told his father he wanted to do music, and his father was like, "Don't do that because that's a hobby. You know, you're not gonna get money out of that. You're not gonna be able to support your family in the future with that." And he lost his motivation. He didn't feel it anymore because he lost his spark. So how do you like deal with that? Um, that's a great question. It's certainly something that's dealt with in the story, right? although um, both of the brothers go to war. So there are many factors. And I think sometimes when people attribute whether or not somebody uh, pursues something to a successful point, uh, or whether that you're able to support yourself off of it, it might be attributed to the fact that it's something creative. But actually, there's a lot of factors that go into whether or not someone's a success. And some of it is preparation. A lot of it is preparation. A lot of it is circumstance. Some of it is support. Some of it is uh, willingness and creativity and how you approach. Like, you know, a lot, all of us have many jobs. We teach, we write, we lecture, we perform, we take gigs that don't necessarily connect to our musical style sometimes. Sometimes we take gigs that are highly connected, like Jerome was talking about, you know. Um, so I think flexibility is a part of it. But yes, I think that rejection is always uh, a component. And I think for artists of color, it's, it's an experience, a reality, and a theme, which is why Baldwin you know, exiled himself to Paris. He, certainly he was facing opposition, pers you know, oppression, racial, and, other, and probably artistic as well, um, being closeted. It's a part, I think that loneliness and alienation is a part of creating art. And it's not a reason to quit. Some of those other things I mentioned, if you don't want to work many jobs, if you don't want to take a risk, it might not be the right fit for you. But um, yes, a I've heard so many no's. Uh, and I, I, uh, I, how do I deal with it? Um, sometimes I, I'm frustrated. Sometimes it, it, uh, it reaches, it touches me, but I think with every year of experience, I go deeper into my own voice and I've, there's something kind of shining in front of me and I follow it. And I work, as you see, I work, I work, I work, 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 yes. <laughs> Um, I think like certain certain professions, certain personalities aren't built to do those those things. A certain um, if you have certain breaking points where you can't continue, if like, you want to go into construction, if you don't, if you can't handle loud loud noise like loud noises, that's not your job for you unless you're like behind the scenes contracting, right? There's just there's just uh, Anybody ever see this movie called Pursuit of Happiness? Y'all saw that? Chris Gardner. It was a book first. There's one line in the book and one line in the movie. I'm glad he kept it. He's talking to his son and he says, if, if follow your dreams, and even if, like, even if I don't listen, even if I don't believe, don't listen to me. <laughs> like, just go, do your thing. And I've been blessed to have have folks, I'm, I feel real bad for any artist in here or anybody who wants to pursue an art and their family don't have their back, like in pursuing it. But it's not because they don't love you, it's because they love you and they, don't, they, they feel like, you know, it's gonna, you, you might turn into a sunny, sunny, you know, it's perspective. So it's like, and it's also this, this horrible word that, the, that I hear thrown around to, to talk about people is pedigree. I don't wanna tell the people at the club that my son is a jazz musician. That's, that's tough because we don't have, if, if, you know, if James Baldwin's parents 
felt like that and he listened, we wouldn't be here right now talking about Sonny's Blues, right? So in, some, in certain ways, you got to be a rebel. They did, actually. Oh, okay. No, I mean, his father, he tells this story, Jerome, this, just what you, on the same point you're saying, of when he was little and he was this phenomenal writer as a small child, under 12, wrote a play, and they did the play at the school. And so he talks about, which I love this story, and you're, you should share this with your friend. I'll help you identify exactly what it is where he tells this story. So his, his English teacher recognizes his gift and white English teacher and comes over to their home, their parental home, the father is a preacher and his mother and, and addresses the parents and says, I'd like to take James to a play, just James. And he said he could see and he was, he kind of scorned. His father was so visibly uh, resistant to the teacher taking him to this play. He did not want this white lady to take his son to the play. And he said only in reflecting, you know, he could see that it was complete fear and unpreparedness for something so ex potentially extraordinary to happen in his life. Every experience his father had had told him that it had him unprepared to imagine his son going off with this white teacher to see a to see a play, um, and so I think that sometimes that's a part of people's perspective or their expectations, and, and sometimes we even hear this in our own head that it's not possible, and and that could be sometimes you know one of the the main obstacles. But Baldwin himself experienced that judgment, so you know I think you know just remember when you read these stories, and I hope you continue to chase them down that these people are not born icons, right? They're born kids like us in Harlem, wherever, in Detroit, you know? So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Lakeisha, please do. I don't wanna beat this in you guys' head. I know we're gonna get to some music real quickly, but um, I just wanna say, Reality is something that faces us all, right? We all know we gotta make money. We all know we have to keep a living. We have to keep, we get married, have kids. But when you're young, that's the time when dreams are limitless. That's the only time in your life that you can foresee whatever is possible. And there's no, there should be no one to put a, a, a taper on that, you know what I mean? So if when you go to bed at night, with all, you, if all you can think about is being a football player. All you can think about is being a scientist. All you can think about is being a doctor. All you can think about is playing a saxophone. That's where your mind goes. My whole life I've had people tell me, oh, women don't play saxophone. Oh, women don't play jazz. Women definitely don't hang out at night with the guys. And if I would have listened to any of that, the career and the livelihood that I love would have been taken from me. Don't ever allow anybody to take your dream. Your dream is the most precious thing you have for as long as you can hold on to it. Because it's your dream that's the, the fuel, like food, pushing you to the next place. So forget money, forget, oh, can I deal with the music business? I love music, but the business, take that out of there. If all you can do is dream notes and dream melodies and dream songs, that's where you go. And you let God take care of the rest, but that's where you go. Yes. On that note, as Jerome said, No, we're, we're talking the truth. I know too well that I'm just wasting precious time to think that such a thing could be that you could ever care for me. I know you hate to hear that I adore you, dear. But grant me just the same. I'm not entirely to blame. 
you'd be so easy to love, so easy to idolize all others above, so worth the yearning for, so swell to keep them fires burning for. We'd be so grand at the game, so carefree together that it does seem a shame. You'd be oh easy to together that it does save a shame you can't see how you'd be easy so easy you'd be easy to love Keisha Benjamin on saxophone. <laughs> Jerome Jennings on the drums. India Owens on the bass. Mika Nishimura on the piano. And I want to thank the very talented Thomas Dempsey. I'd like to thank Vice Chancellor Davis and, and Mark and all of you for coming, all of your professors, continue this conversation in the reception with us and in life and stick by each other and continue to support each other. And uh, thank you for being here. I'm Candace Hoyes. I'll see you soon. See you at the reception.